Um, my name is Ryan De Silva. This is uh, Adam Sussman. Uh, we both here, work here at Eventbrite. Uh, and I want to start off by getting to know all of you a little bit better. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to make you do any crazy things. I just want to get a show of hands for people who uh, have any accounting backgrounds. OK. Uh, show of hands for people who are more on the engineering side. Cool. Uh, and show of hands of people who know what double entry bookkeeping is. Yeah, OK. All right. Uh, so hopefully this isn't going to be like old news for a lot of you, but what we're going to be talking about today is this, uh, this funny little world where both marketplace uh, finance and engineering meet in the middle, uh, and what the overlap is, and uh, some of the unique problems that you run into this area, uh, and how, uh, what we've learned about how to solve those problems and what we're working on right now. Um, at the end, there's also going to be an invite. If you want to talk more about this, if you want to learn more about this and brainstorm, uh, we'd like to set up something where we can do a deeper dive on it. Um, so that said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why you care. I think most of you already have your own reasons for why you care, but I want, would like to actually spend a little time uh, talking about uh, you know, other reasons why you might care, uh, share some context on the problem. I think I just gave you a quick summary, but I want to go into it a little bit more detail. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Adam to talk about what we've learned and uh, what we're actually building, and finally spend some time on Q&A. Okay? Uh, if you do have any questions that are really quick, put your hand up. If, you, if they're a little longer, please hold on to them until after the Q&A. Great. So uh, why you care? Um, this is kind of obvious. If you have customers, which hopefully you do if you're actually here at a marketplace finance or accounting uh, you know, talk, uh, then your customers care a lot, and if you don't handle their money very well, if you, if you have errors in, you know, in what you're displaying to customers, they're gonna, you're going to lose their trust very quickly. They're going to walk away. Uh, they'll be happy to spend their money somewhere else. Uh, the less obvious reason for why you might care is because it actually does affect your company valuation. Uh, investors look for many things. Amongst those are margins, transparency, consistency, and growth. Uh, one small way you can actually help on the margin side is that if an investor is looking at an overall company's valuation and expenses, they actually do care about SG&A. Uh, and your finance team falls under SG&A. And so uh, you can actually affect that in a little way by providing really great tools and really great reporting, which I'll get to in a moment, like how this actually all ties together, um, to help your finance team, help your finance team stay small and lean. Uh, transparency, uh, if you can actually report on all this marketplace data um, in a way that is very for easy for consumers, organizers, merchants, whatever you may call them to understand, but also your investors, um, you're going to have a lot more trust, a lot more perceived trust. Uh, ditto with consistency, if you can continue to provide accurate data, and a lot of this is about accuracy, um, you can actually get to the point where investors will see a recurring track record and they'll start to believe you a lot more and you can actually help your company raise funds. And that's how it tries in the growth. If your company can raise funds um, and if you can actually give your CFO or your investor relations team the tools that they need to be able to present this data to investors and tell a really compelling story, uh, you can help raise more funds and actually use that to channel into uh, capital intensive investments. So um, something that I think I, I never really thought too much about. Uh, I guess there, is, there are certain circumstances where this comes more to light, but I wanted to share my thoughts on this with all of you. Uh, and some context on the problem. So most of you, if you have worked in this, any, any financial area before, have accounted audit type problems, internal control type problems. We're not going to talk about these today, um, which I'm glad about, because there's like a, a lot of detail in here, uh, and it's not always extremely technical. There are a lot of things that we will touch on here, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. What we are going to spend more time on is accuracy, resilience, and accounting principles, and how those two actually kind of pair well together. So if you start off, if you're starting a company and you think about it strictly as like a B2C company, you have money flowing one way, you know, customers to business, uh, things are actually fairly simple, and you can do your accounting in a fairly straightforward manner. Uh, it's not too complicated. Uh, and you know, if you look at this very straightforward representation of money coming in, um, you can see it's it's simple. You do run into challenges if you start if your business starts to evolve and you start to have to deal with new use cases. So if you want to deal with transfers, it gets a little trickier with something like this. This is oversimplified, I'm sure. Everyone has something that's far more complicated than this, but this is more just illustrative. Now. As you add more entities, as you actually trend more into marketplace, uh, things do get a lot more complicated. And 
I'm going to try to illustrate why. Uh, if you add a new entity, you have to now, if you think about it from this perspective, add a new column at the very least. Uh, and as you keep adding more and more entities, and in this case, I'm talking about like a, a partner. So you have a consumer, you've got the business, you've got the partner, you've got a merchant, and you've got taxes. Uh, and you have all of these different things which actually re represent different balances. They have their own problems. They have changes in balances. You're moving money back and forth between these different entities. These are sometimes represented with different currencies, and you can see the problem starts to get, a, you know, maybe not exactly exponentially, sometimes exponentially more complicated. Um, take this and add payouts, and you have a whole level of complications beyond that. Okay. So, introducing the concept of double entry for those who are not familiar with it. This is a, this is a really abstracted version of it. I'm not going to go very deep into a lot of the accounting concepts behind this. But at a very simple level, if you take that, that example that I had before, uh, and you give each person their own set of balances, uh, you end up with something that after every event has occurred, you have an entry in each of their balances, and there's a final total sum at the end of the day. Uh, that final total sum can actually be abstracted into accounting concepts, such as liability, income, cash. And uh, you actually have something here which kind of close, maps a little closer to how the accounting and finance team thinks about things. Um, what I showed you here is how consumers and all the different entities will see it. And you can see that you take that same view and you, you can map these concepts onto it. So um, beyond just having these different balances, there's one more difference that I want to highlight with single entry and double entry. Uh, and that is there's a shift in complexity when you go from one system to another. Uh, single entry, low transactional area risk. If you're actually you're creating one entry every time an event is taking place, it's actually relatively simple. Whereas double entry, if you're actually creating multiple entries and if you have some kind of a service-oriented architecture, you have more of a transactional area risk. And so there's potentially a chance for events to get dropped or events to get partially registered. Uh, on the flip side, good news is that reporting is easier with double entry because you have these different balances and you actually have something that, you know, in your system, in the actual way you're representing the data, it gives you balances really quickly, very easily. Uh, it gives you a very strong sense of uh, strong typing, I guess, not typing really, but strong sense of ownership of who owns what funds in your system. Uh, reporting in single entries is a little bit more complicated uh, when you're dealing with multiple entities. Okay. Going back to what I talked about, cash, liability, income, uh, this maps into like a larger uh, accounting system of the accounting equation, assets, liabilities, and shareholders equity. Uh, and you can see the breakdown over there and its revenues is what we're representing as income. And the reason this is important is because this can be used as an integrity check. You can actually take all the entries that you're creating in your uh, double entry system and uh, integrity check these both individually but also in aggregate to help you understand like if you have dropped something on the floor, where did the drop, you know, how much are you missing? And then you can also use the same system to go create adjustments for it. Cool? Okay. So has it been done before? Yeah, this is not a new concept. Uh, the accounting formula and uh, you know, double entry has actually been around for uh, over 100 years. I can't remember the exact date uh, it was created. Um, it's not a brand new system. There are ERP systems that do this kind of stuff all the time. ERP systems don't do a great job of this. We looked at other systems that are sort of quote unquote off the shelf to solve this specific problem. This specific problem being bookkeeping and keeping balances. Uh, and we found that there were some that were really solid, but there were things that we were not super happy with in all cases. So we're not going to talk a ton about these. Um, but I would like to hand it over now to Adam to talk about what we've learned so far as we went through this whole process. Uh, Eventbrite, as you may or not, may not know, processes about uh, 100 million or so tickets per year. Uh, and so the scale that we're dealing with that, uh, Adam's been working here for a while. He's learned a lot over the time. Uh, and he's going to talk about what uh, lessons he's learned and what we're actually doing now to change the way that we're, actually, we're representing this data to our finance team. Hi everybody, my name is Adam Sussman. I'm an engineer here at Eventbrite. Uh, I am not an accountant. Um, some days I wish I was because that tends to be the problem set I wind up dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and I'm kind of, kind of curious about you guys actually. I know most of you are engineers. I'm curious uh, how many of you who are engineers um, are also accountants or do uh, traditional finance accountant stuff, would you say? I see one guy, two guys. All right, three guys. 
not, not very many of you. And we've actually found this to be kind of a problem. Um, you know, in our world, we're, we're what we call a marketplace. We're kind of like an eBay or uh, an Airbnb or an Etsy in the sense that we have buyers and sellers on our system, and we're acting as the man in the middle, uh, moving money in between these guys. Now, for me, traditionally, I've been in e-commerce for 25 years. Most of the time, um, we don't really worry about the finance department or what the finance guys think. Um, you know, it's, it's not part of our world. We throw stuff over the fence at them. They throw stuff over the fence at us and that's the end of it. But when we get into the marketplace world where we have multiple parties trading money together, all of a sudden we're required to learn a whole new skill set and a whole new set of principles. Um, and it's been, it's been a bit of a challenge. And people who have both the skill sets of engineering and finance accounting are very thin on the ground. So we've had to learn a lot. Um, and to the point where we've had to learn, well, what is a, what is a proper solution to this problem even look like? What are all the pieces, right? It's not just the double entry bookkeeping system, but it's also the ecosystem that surrounds it. Um, so, you know, as an engineer and as a designer, um, you know, the first thing we always do is we come up with the pretty picture. So everybody got that set? We're done? Okay. We're gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like ask you guys to read all this and drill down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the bits and pieces, right? So, you know, there's really kind of four what I would call principles for pillars uh, of, of how we look at this problem and how we try to deal with it. So the first idea is that we need a closed loop system. And this, this means a system where um, we're actually tracking everything. So I don't know if this, maybe this problem sounds familiar to you. Um, you try to pay somebody th automatically through their bank account, through a credit card. It fails and you don't know why. So somebody in the back room writes a paper check, sticks it in an envelope and sends it to them and they never told you about it. Now your system doesn't know that they were paid. Right? So there's a lot of data leakage that you have to go chase after. Um, and you have to actually make sure that you're even knowledgeable in capturing all the things. Because what you need to have at the end of the day is a system that's accurate, that you can actually make correct decisions on, that you can produce correct reports on, and that you can drive correct automation on. And the first time we ran into, the first time we sat down and said, let's inventory everybody who's doing something, whether it be part of our software product or uh, a piece of paper on somebody's desk or a post-it note or an Excel spreadsheet. And we found, you know, 130 things, which was about 100 more than we expected. Um, and so, you know, your first step here is really how do I corral all this stuff together? Um, and it's important that you actually know everything that's going on and that nothing is escaping you. The second step for us is, is what we call the source of truth. This is really, um, you know, in simple terms, it's an audit journal, right? What did your system do? What is the history of what went on? What are the facts of your system? Um, and I'm, I'm going to say that this is not the same as accounting because what we're trying to do here is meet not just accounting needs, but also kind of auditability needs for later. So when third-party auditors come in and look at the system, and, and for us, we're looking forward to a day, you know, we're not public now, but we want to go public. And when you do go public, there's kind of a higher bar that you need to meet. There are people who come in from the outside and they start um, you know, interrogating your data in all kinds of ways and you need to be ready to meet that. Um, so for us, this is a, a system that has to have certain kinds of special characteristics. So as an example, um, and for some of you this will be obvious, it was not obvious for us and it certainly wasn't obvious for the people who founded our company 10 years ago, um, which is just that uh, your financially critical data should not be mutable. Nobody should be able to change it. Your product should not change it. Um, you know, for us, um, our system was not built that way. I've talked to other people who built that day from day one. Great for them. Wasn't great for us. Um, so it may seem obvious, but it's not obvious to everybody, um, especially if you're a startup growing up and you're starting to outgrow your own systems. Um, so, you know, we've started to build that system and, you know, we've had that in place for a while where um, the data goes in, it can't be changed, um, and there are consequences to that that add complexity. So, for example, um, if I write data and it's a mistake, I need to come back and I need to correct it, but I can't update it, so I have to add more data, which means I have to post uh, additional rows, and now everything downstream of that needs to know, oh, 
All right, this is a correction of this previous data, uh, and you know to treat that correctly. Um, so there's there's lots of aspects to this system, but what we're really after is a factual, as much accurate as we can, history of the things that happened in our system that are transactional in nature that might be financially significant. Uh, and for us, this actually winds up to be a pretty complex data set. We have a lot of uh, difficult transactions and things that are hard to understand. The next part, of course, which, which Ryan already talked about, is the double entry bookkeeping. Um, you know, like, like a lot of startups, um, we started with people who had no concept of this concept, no, never heard of it, didn't care, um, you know, and, and we grew up with a single entry accounting system. And guess what? It has a lot of problems, right? So, you know, we have to, uh, you know, and so we're building this where we actually want the double entry bookkeeping system, um, you know, b for a lot of reasons too, because the math gives us a lot more security. It's kind of a proven thing. Um, the other thing is that, you know, our customers are buyers and sellers of tickets, um, but our customers are also accountants if you look at it in that way. Some of our, our organizers are big enough that they have their own accounting departments. Some of them are big enough they have their own accountants. And when they want to have questions answered, a double entry bookkeeping system actually gives them that information in the way they're used to seeing and the way that they can understand. And you don't have to actually try to explain it. And there's a lot of value in that. Um, and you know, when it comes to third-party auditors and things like that, um, you, know, you talk about your SOX compliance or whatever, it's the same thing. These people all speak accounting speak. They understand the math. Um, and, and if your system works this way, it's so much easier and it's so much, so much better. Um, so you know, really, we're working on a system here that, that does the accounting in this manner um, that we're going to use to drive all of our accounting decisions and reporting. Um, this one's a, a new one for us. You know, the, the source of truth, uh, the previous slide we've already built, and we know what the technology for that was and everything. Um, you know, we're in process on this one. We've designed it, but it's our first round, and, you know, we're learning as we go. Um, we would love to hear from any of you who have done this yourselves and any things that you have learned, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, the last big piece of the system um, has to do with reconciliation and what we call data health. Um, you know, the, the first part of this system that I talked about, which was the, the source of truth in this accurate record, I could go to you and I could say, yeah, yeah, my database is 100%, it's perfect, right? And you should in no way believe me, right? You should not believe me. Because we all know as engineers, your system's never perfect. There's always going to be a problem. Um, and, you know, financial people know this and auditors know this, right? And what they really want to see is the fact that you've got some kind of process to know that you have data problems and to do something about your data problems. So the way we deal with this is really, um, it's about kind of checks and balances and it's about data comparisons. So really you're looking for discrepancies in your data by comparing against no other data. So a great example of this is um, I can go download my daily credit card processing logs from my vendor and I can compare it against my own database. And if they've got more than I do, which sometimes they do because of problems, um, then I've got an issue that I need to deal with. And you know, if I'm not looking for that, I won't know that I have a problem until a customer calls me and says, why did you charge me twice on this? But if I'm doing this process, I can see that before they notice. Um, and so this whole area is about doing that. You know, compare against payment processors, compare against banks, compare against other internal data sources, and then to have a process where uh, people can look at it and do something about it. Um, sometimes you can automate this, sometimes you can't. Um, you know, we have a lot of systems for this, and we have a lot of people who work on it as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of a kind of a quick overview. Of course, we got lots of challenges. Um, you know, I'm sure some of these challenges are familiar to you. I'm not, not going to belabor them all, um, but we'd love to talk to you guys and learn more about what you what you're doing. Um, if you've solved any of these things in a great way, we'd really love to hear about it. Um, and we're really uh, because we've had such a hard time and our own learning curve um, and getting to where we have a good idea of what's going on and the things that we need. You know, we kind of really appreciate the, the gap and um, really hoping that we can get together with you guys and, and learn as we go. 
Um, so for that, you know, we're, we're trying to put together um, a little more in-depth dinner where we can, you know, talk more technical, talk more at length. Um, we'll be doing that on October 26th, uh, where we have dinner here catered. Um, and if you're interested, you know, please reach out to us um, for an invite. Um, and I'm not sure how much time left we have, but if we do, uh, I'd be happy to take questions, um, answer any, any questions you guys have. Yeah, and one thing I'd like to add, Adam's being very humble about saying that we'd like to learn a lot from everyone we, we do. Um, Adam has made you know, huge strides in these areas over the years, and so all these problems are up here because Adam's thought deeply and very hard about them for quite a while and has solved, like, put a lot of effort into solving them too. So I, um, that said, uh, we would, yeah, we'd love to take questions. Um, what do you guys have? I'm wondering, um, so at which point, you know, uh, I work for a startup, so we built a billing system from scratch. So at which point uh, you think, like, how many transactions per day happens? Uh, like, can we start thinking of form a uh, account accounting department? It's, it's a tough question. It, this is one of those things where it's, you don't do this from day one. It's too expensive, right? even if you know you need to do it. But it's also one of those things where, God, you wish you had, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, doing time zones in your database or being multilingual on day one, right? You know you should do it, but you don't because you got enough, a lot of other stuff and you're busy, um, and there comes the day where now you have to do it and you've got a retrofit. For us, um, it's really been a process of, uh, on the one hand, Sorry? Oh, oh sorry. someone else. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of noise here. On the one hand, when you're small and you're a startup, you kind of sail under the radar for a lot of things. You can get away with a lot, right? There does come a day when your bank calls you up and they say, hey, you're not compliant with this thing. You didn't do your taxes right. Or um, you're not complying with terrorist laws or whatever it is, right? And then, and then you start to start, then that's when you start, have to start thinking and say, all right, you know, what's my strategy going to be? Because once a bank or government institution starts to bug you about that stuff, you're, there's a clock ticking, right? And you've only got so long before you have to do something. And something that happens more frequently than that is that you get product requests from product managers. Mm -hmm. uh, and those product requests tend to try to throw you for a loop because they kind of assume your system can do a certain thing. Uh, and, you know, sometimes when you run that as complexity, you have to, like, keep patching stuff onto it, uh, which is another reason why you kind of always end up wishing you'd kind of built this in at the start. Although where this really started for us and where it started for me was several years ago when uh, one of our customers, one of our larger customers, uh, came to us and they said, we don't trust your numbers. We don't trust the money that you're paying to us. Prove to us that you're doing the right thing. And that turned out to be extremely, like we put a lot of effort into that, um, an extraordinary amount of effort to like answer that question. And we looked at that and we said, you know, this problem doesn't scale. They're not gonna be the first to ask this. And it's a totally reasonable ask, right? So how are we gonna solve this? Um, so there's no hard and fast rule, right? But you do run out of runway as you grow bigger and as your clients get more demanding and as you know, banks and institutions start to take more notice of you. I think as a startup approaching, you have to focus on the job that, you know, the job that's going to happen, like, almost right away. Yeah, True. so the comment that was just made, just to repeat it, um, the first thing that startups will have to focus on is chargebacks because it's happened fairly quickly in the life cycle. Mm -hmm. it, it is true, although, um, you know, I will say we still manage our chargebacks manually at this point, rather than in an automated fashion. And, you know, it's it's there's lots of things. It's it's like anything else, right? There's a hundred things. What are you going to start with? Um, it's where you're bleeding money the worst. Um, you know, fortunately for us, we have an extremely strong fraud team um, that that really prevents a, a, you know a lot of the excessive fraud that that you would expect, um, and they've been able to kind of delay how long we've had until we like, need to deal with that problem in automation. Although, you know, it, it is there. We do see it all the time. Um, but we're, we're in a better world today than we were. We used to have a payment processor who would send us chargebacks by fax. <laughs> so we've at least, you know, we're at least in a better place than that, you know. I start working for the startup, there's no billing system. 
then I came from a, like a, I came from a banking uh, background where in banking all the like uh, everything is done in the double bookkeeping it does double entry bookkeeping so but the CTO asked me why uh, single entry keeping doesn't work well I have like I have no way to like defend that so yeah, then let's just start from single bookkeeping. But as is, as you mentioned, yeah, one day we will like if we do convert that into double bookkeeping, is it like very tough to do? One, one way you can cheat is by saying today I will start double entry bookkeeping, but yesterday is still single entry. So you can you can save yourself a lot of pain if you make a cutoff date. Um, you know, for in, in terms of defending double entry bookkeeping, you know, we've, we've had some of the same issue. We've had to do a lot of, of, of kind of soul searching on this, but really there, there are a couple of things that, that come to the top of mind on this. The first is that, you know, if you look at the mathematics of double entry bookkeeping, there are a number of built-in guarantees that you get that a single entry system just does not get you. So it is inherently, um, I don't want to say error correcting, but it is inherently error revealing. Um, and that is that is a very important property, um, and it's something that you can easily automate, you know, as part of every entry, as part of your end of day logic, um, you know, to, and that gives you a much, uh, you know, it gives you a, a, a head start on what the, the problems are. The second is, like I said, you know, when, when you get bigger, when you have big clients, when you have auditors, um, they all speak the language of double entry bookkeeping, right? And your uh, your 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 process of uh, compliance and remediation for compliance is going to be so much cheaper um, if you have that. We've got another question at the uh, got another question at the back, and after that question, uh, I'd like to ask the audience a quick show of hands for something else. But um, go for it. Cool. Hey, hello. Thank you. Hey, good evening. Uh, thank you for giving this talk this evening. Uh, when you're at the point where you're building a system like this, are there any other sort of accounting systems you think you should also evaluate building around that time? Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of depends on where you're at. So, so the first distinction to draw is that we are not trying to be the finance department and we're not trying to serve the finance department's needs. Right, so we're very focused. So we're not going to do your general ledger or your HR or your payroll or anything where there's already an ERP solution. We're really focused on um, sort of the marketplace, the the you know man in the middle economics of things. Um, you know the, the the kind of the pillars that I presented are the things that we think need to go around this. Right, it is not enough to have a double entry bookkeeping system. You need to have a, a source of data that you trust to go into it. You need to have processes to evaluate the quality of your data and correct the quality of your data. Um, and you, you need to have monitoring, you need to have, um, you know, a lot of it comes down to your product as well. You know, if you're performing financial functions for people in your product, be it a web or mobile or whatever it is, um, those, those applications need to be doing the right thing as well. Um, and you can give a lot of power to people in, the, in a wrong way, like in a bad way, in a dangerous way. And you have to be very conscious of what you let people do um, with the transaction. So it's, 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 a, it's a lot of, it's an ecosystem. Um, and you know, you're talking about transaction logs, you're talking about um, data reconciliation and data matching, you're talking about monitoring, escalations, and a, a lot of things like that. Um, so, Try, we try to look at it holistically, right? It's not one piece of software is gonna save our day. It's a collection of stuff and it's a collection of people.